Good afternoon, brethren. This is part two of God, his name, his image, and his shape. I have, I've reproduced the whole um, article that the Lord gave me. If you, if you listen to part one, you know that God gave me an article uh, that, I had a, that, that I had a lot of trouble bringing it forth. It was, um, it was a very creative work, and I had to pull it out of his eternal seed that's in the midst of me. It just never ceases to amaze me that when I go through something like that, that it's so hard getting the revelation, and then I go back a couple of days later, it looks so simple on paper, because it wasn't literally a birthing process, bringing forth the information that was stressful. And then I look at it on the paper, and it's like just a few, a few simple points. But there was a birthing process to bringing forth the revelation that is, that is in Christ. All of the, the infinite, the, there is an infinite word of God that is in Christ, but we have to dig it out. And that, I think, is mentioned in the Psalms. So I went over the, the, the article again, and I made a couple of changes, I made a couple of corrections, clarified a few things, and in particular, a very important issue, you know, this issue of the comforter, because the Holy Spirit is not the comforter. Uh, and, and so I, I investigated the two scriptures that, that the writer set forth, and in, indeed there are two scriptures that mention the Holy Spirit, and the difference in them is that one the Father is sending and the other one Jesus is sending. So I have a little exhortation on that worked into these notes. And uh, also what was clarified for me is who the man-child is specifically in, in the context of all of the names and the scenarios that I bring forth here, who exactly is the man-child? So today I'm, I'm believing that the man-child is the mind of God in us, or the mind of Christ as Paul calls it. Because a man-child has to be born. So what is born? The, the offspring of the seed of Christ joined to the, the human soul gives birth to a mind, the mind of Christ, okay, or the mind of God. So the man-child is actually the mind of God. Now, a lot of Christians assume they have the mind of God, but they don't have the mind of God. The mind of God is, uh, is the spirit, the spirit of truth is in the mind of God. So the proof of the mind of God is the spiritual truth, is the ability to discern truth, is the ability to dig out the kind of truth that I was just describing to you. The ability to see with, a, with righteousness, what does that mean, to see with righteousness? It means to put your own personal interests aside. Maybe the truth is not in your best interest. A person who does not have the mind of God or the righteousness of God will not accept the truth if it, if it violates their own self-interest or the interest of their family or their loved ones. You see. So, I understand today that the, that the mind of God is actually that man-child that's born. And then we're told in the book of Revelation, if it's born, it has to be caught up to God. Well, that can mean several things. So there could be several stages of that mind being caught up to God. It's not doing you any good. The mind of God is not doing you any good if it's lying down under the authority of your carnal mind. Excuse me, if your carnal mind is beating it up and abusing it and not letting it manifest its truth through you, if you don't believe it, if you don't believe the spirit of truth that's in the mind of God, if you prefer your carnal mind, whether it's conscious or unconscious, okay, if the, if the truth that you embrace the reality of the truth that you embrace is the truth of this world, then you might just as well have not had the mind of God if, you, if he's lying under the authority of the, of the carnal mind because you are choosing to believe the carnal mind because of unrighteousness, because of an unrighteous motive in your soul. You have to love the truth, brethren. You have to, if you want to go on with God, you have to love the truth even when it hurts, you see. So, the mind of God has to be caught up to God. That child is born and it's caught up to God. It has to be caught up above the carnal mind, which involves a warfare. It involves driving the carnal mind underfoot, which is the tribulation process. It is the personal tribulation process. It's always um, 
uh, can I say it's always painful? It's never pleasant. With some, with some people, it's more painful than others. But the process of driving your fallen nature as it's manifested in your carnal mind under the authority of the spirit of truth, which is in Christ Jesus, again, okay, is painful. And it doesn't happen overnight. And then, as I understand it today, the final stage, or one of the final stages, if not the final stage, of the, of the mind of God and you being caught up to God is its unification with the Lord Jesus Christ who is in heaven, mm -hmm. which brings Christ Jesus into existence in your own spiritual universe. Each one of us is a spiritual universe. Our soul and the mind in that soul, okay, and mind is a combination of spirit and soul, is, a, is an individual spiritual universe. So I asked, well, is that the birthing of the man-child when the Lord Jesus joins with Christ in us? But I don't think so, okay? And I never really saw it quite this way before, that the union is really not between the Lord Jesus and Christ in us, because Christ in us has already, um, I don't know if morphed is the right word or not, but Christ in us, by the time the Lord Jesus would be looking to join with him, has already, Christ in us has already joined with our soul. That, that seed of Christ that comes through the Holy Spirit, okay, that, that forms the Holy Spirit in us. Mm -hmm. That seed which the church world perceives as the Holy Ghost experience. That comes with what the church ex perceives to be the Holy Ghost. Okay, joins with our soul. Okay. And now it's no longer Christ, because it's now joined to our soul. And when it's joined to our soul, and that's the marriage to our soul, which I've actually spoken about in, in depth for quite a while. So when that seed, that female soy of, of, uh, of, of the second Adam joins to our soul and marries it, it becomes a new creature, which is the mind of God or the mind of Christ in us. So the Lord Jesus Christ is actually marrying the mind of Christ in us. What does that mean? Well, let me go back. Okay. Let me review for you, though, this Holy Spirit that the, the church world thinks there is a spirit that is coming, well, there is a spirit coming down, but it's not the Holy Spirit of promise that's coming down. What's coming down is actually, uh, is actually the Shekinah, which is the, which is the spirit of, of grace, okay? And she comes down with the female side of the second Adam. And she drops that seed into our human spirit. And that human spirit is, is, an, is an ocean or a lake, it's a body of water. The human spirit is a, is a body of water in us. Right now she's joined to Satan because we're fallen. So the human spirit is joined to Satan. Excuse me. So the Shekinah comes down and drops the, the female side of the second Adam to war against Satan, okay? Because so now we have the seed, the female side of the second Adam joined to our human spirit and and to Satan, okay, so that human spirit now has two husbands, you see, and, uh, and she's divided, you see. So um, that is what the Holy Spirit is. It's when that seed, that female side of the second Adam, joins with our human spirit, which is a body of water, okay, a body of, of, of it's not a sea, it's, um, it's lake water, it's clean water, okay, and that's the Holy Spirit. So actually what I'm saying is that the Holy Spirit is formed in the individual when that seed, that female side of the second Adam, okay, comes down and, and drops on us. It joins with the human spirit, and the Holy Spirit is actually born in us, and that is the first born-again experience. So I hope you can understand that it's not a Holy Spirit coming down. It is the spirit of the Shekinah coming down but she cannot cleave unto us. The spirit of the Shekinah does not cleave unto us. She delivers the seed that joins with our human spirit, that which unification produces the Holy Spirit and the gifts and all of its manifestations in the individual. That's why different people experience the Holy Spirit in different ways. It's the same Holy Spirit. It's basically the same seed. But one person will speak, and I've, I've known people that speak in tongues and they have this simple phrase, itamata. I, I know someone, I can think of her right now, unfortunately she's dead. She had like a simple string of characters, of sounds, and she just, that was her tongues. And I, was, I heard other people, 
and I don't have this. They have beautiful tongues. They just roll out of their mouth, beautiful sounding to your to your spirit and your ears. I don't have any. I don't have beautiful tongues. Okay, my tongues are, are, are different. Well, it just doesn't matter what my tongues are. I hardly use them at all anymore. Why? Because they're being they're being swallowed up into Christ Christ in me. Everybody has different tongues. Well, it's the same Holy Spirit. How do you have different tongues? Okay? I just explained it to you. There is a spirit that delivers that seed to this world, okay? But the spirit that delivers the seed doesn't stay with us. It drops the seed, which gets grafted to our human spirit, and the delivering spirit, which is the Shekinah, withdraws. Then that seed, which is Christ, and everybody gets the same Christ seed, okay? But it joins to everybody's human spirit. And everybody's human spirit is not in the same condition. Everybody has a human spirit, but everybody's human spirit is joined to Satan to varying degrees. So we're, we're all good and evil in varying degrees along the spectrum. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay. So, uh, so that, that seed called Christ then, after a season, sometimes it manifests as the gifts. And sometimes, it, it bypasses the gifts and marries the soul right away. And uh, that is the mind of God, which is manifested by the way you think. You have to have somebody that has the mind of God discern whether or not you have the mind of God. You cannot discern it yourself. You cannot, you cannot use your, your potentially carnal mind, potentially. You cannot use your carnal mind to judge whether or not you have the mind of God. Well, maybe you can use the mind of God to judge whether or not you have the mind of God. What are you comparing it to? You, you, you can't do it yourself, you see. The mind of God in you has to be recognized by more than one person. It doesn't have to be me only. Anybody who has the mind of God should be able to recognize whether or not your thinking process is coming out of the mind of God or your kind of mind, and, and what percentage of time uh, this is happening. Do you think with the mind of God once a year? Or is, is it that your default? Do you default to the, to, to the Christ mind? You need to have many witnesses as to who you are. If you want the truth, you see. And if you don't want the truth, you don't have it. If you don't want the truth, you don't have it, you see. Okay, so, so the mind of God is, what is, lit, is the literal born-again experience, okay, which comes in stages. The beginning is the impartation of the seed, which when it joins to your human spirit manifests a lot of the times as the gifts, which is what the church world knows as being born again. And then, but its ultimate goal is to marry your soul. If it doesn't, if that seed does not marry your soul, all that you've had is, a, is an experience that has boosted your pride and said, look at me, Ma, I'm prophesying on the floor of the church. That's all you have if you don't, if you don't birth the mind of God, you see. Okay? And then once you birth the mind of God, then I think it's a long process of developing that mind of God, bringing your soul into agreement with the mind of God. It's a long process. We've been studying here for years and years and years to develop the mind of God. What, see, see, this actually was a question in my mind that is now answered. How could something that comes from God grow, either if it comes from God it's 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 God's it's God it's God right well Christ is the creation of God because Adam is the creation of God so Christ does come from God but he's marrying or she's marrying your soul so it's actually the mind of God in you that has to develop and mature and grow because your soul is there and your soul your soul is is actually I don't know is your soul if your soul is that evil it's amoral I'm not sure I think the soul, the soul is whatever the, the spirit leads it to be. The soul is capable of becoming very, very, very evil. So it's the soul aspect of the mind of God in us, okay? It's, it's not just the soul, it's that, that, un, that unified new creature, the mind of God, that has to grow and mature and that can make mistakes. So I've had that question for a while, how can, how can Christ in me make a mistake? You know, I didn't really understand it. It's the, it's the child that makes the mistake. It's the creature 
the Son of God that is, is born of the Christ seed and my soul, which has the potential to be good or evil. So that's what makes mistakes. It's not the seed of God that makes a mistake. It's the child that's born, okay, which is capable of making mistakes because it's soul and spirit. Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. So this is a new revelation to me, and, I, and it's answering a very important question. And I'm very happy to be able to share it with you, because someday, somewhere, someone's going to ask you that question. How can Christ make a mistake? You know, if, you're, if you say, Sheila, that you're preaching and teaching and running this ministry by, by, the, by the Spirit of Christ, which I believe I am, which I now know would not be the right word to express it, but that's what I would tell you if you ask me, is Christ is, is, in, is running this ministry, how could you make a mistake, Sheila? That's how I make a mistake, because it's not Christ, it's not the Christ seed that's running the ministry. Neither is it Christ Jesus, because that won't happen until the Lord Jesus marries my Christ mind. It is the child that is running this ministry, that which is born of the union of the Christ seed and my soul, which is, can be either good or evil. So it's the spiritual child that's born in me that is being trained, and that training process is called being caught up to God. So I'm very happy to share that with you because there are naysayers out there that will be asking you that question. How can Christ, uh, if you are truly ministering by the Spirit of God, how could you make a mistake? Okay, that's how I make a mistake. Excuse me, brother. Okay. And uh, this, this is the, the difference between what God is doing today <coughs> and what he did with national Israel. There was no child born in national Israel. That's the condemnation of national Israel. There was no child. They brought forth wind. They didn't bring forth the child, and they died. As, as the representatives of God. Why? Because they, <coughs> they were given power without growing up into that power. They were given that power without the, 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 the experiences of maturation that would have defended that power. And they fell because of the lack of experience and maturing experiences. So here in the second dispensation that's called the New Testament or the New Covenant, the Lord Jesus Christ is starting, is bringing the, his son into existence from seed. And we have experiences that are sometimes wonderful and exhilarating, excuse me, sometimes painful and disappointing. But we should know that overall we are having the totality of our experiences are qualifying us to rise to where national Israel was and higher. And national Israel, were, they were an, uh, a supernatural people. So this is very, very good news, and it should really help us in the difficult and disappointing times. So we are the child. We are the child. The mind of Christ, the mind of God, is, and I can say both, because Christ is a, well, Paul says, Let, let's just say mind of Christ, since it's Christ joined to our soul, let's say it's the mind of Christ. Okay. So we're growing and having experiences and being trained and making mistakes and required to straighten the record. When we make a mistake, we have to straighten out the record. See, the carnal mind hides it. I know that there are preachers that just pull their books off the market because they made a mistake. You know, they don't tell anybody about it. You have to set the record straight. If you taught something that's wrong, you have to tell the people. If it's in a personal relationship and you give false information, as soon as you find out you gave that person false information, you have to correct the record. Because what you say is a living thing. It's a living thing that is, is involved in, that has a part in molding the consciousness of the person that you gave that false information to. Okay. So I'm really excited about this information about the, the mind of Christ. And, okay, so now, when the Lord Jesus Christ marries, now we now know he's not marrying Christ in us. He's marrying the mind of Christ in us because the mind of Christ is the child. He's marrying his own offspring. Incest is allowed in the spiritual world. It's not allowed in the visible world, in this world of action. Incest is not allowed. It's not allowed between physical bodies 
but interest is allowed between spiritual principles. See? So the Lord Jesus Christ is marrying his own son. And when he marries his own son, he's imparting the male side of the second Adam to the mind of Christ in you. See? When the Lord Jesus Christ marries the mind of Christ in you, okay, then the mind of Christ is the son. When the Lord Jesus, when the father marries his own son, he's imparting the male side of Christ to that child. He's literally imparting his manhood to him. And that entity that is now possessing you is called Christ Jesus, the second Adam, and the second Adam has supernatural power. So I'm happy to report that to you, brother. Amen. Okay. So what I'd like to do, since um, since we did go over these notes on Thursday, I'd like to go through them quickly uh, just to make sure uh, I'm not, I'm, I might have made a little change here or a little change there. So I want to read through them quickly and then go on to the second half of the notes that we did not uh, experience on Thursday and, 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 and understand some, uh, some very important points of the New Testament. We really have to get this, brethren. It's really exciting to learn about Genesis. It's really exciting to learn about the fall. We, it was really exciting to learn about the aliens. But we have to master the, new, the, the doctrine of the New Testament, which, which is in the Old Testament. Every, everything's in the Torah. The Torah is infinite, and everything's in it. I'm going to be saying Torah from time to time because we will be ministering to Jews. Okay, they. They may even get offended. Well, if they get offended at the term of the Old Testament, there's nothing I can do about it. But I will say Torah in a, in a hope of communicating with them. Maybe they don't really know what I mean when I say the Old Testament. Now. So the Torah is the five books of Moses. That, the, what we read in a book is simply one expression of a spiritual reality. The Torah is a spiritual reality. The Torah is the Word of God. And the word of God is actually primordial Adam. The word of God is primordial Adam. Okay, the end stuff inside the empty space with some details, but I, if I re-preach everything, we'll, we'll let me get out of here. Okay, I'll, okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> okay, the creation started with an infinite point. Okay, that is the ancient one. The infinite point extended itself and added six branches to itself. Okay, and then so to seed, which, which, which was the tenth extension. So there was now ten separate, at the, which is, which they were now ten separate, which manifested as the Elohim of Genesis 1. So I did it quickly. If you didn't get it, you have to listen to the previous message. Did you get it? Okay. Okay. So Adam Kenmon, primordial Adam, is the whole ten separate. Adam Kenmon is the whole ten separate. Okay. And, he, and his name, he appears under the name Elohim in Genesis chapter 1. So he is the word of God. The Kabbalists will tell you the first thing in the empty space, the first thing that was there, they will tell you what the Hebrew letters. Okay. In the church we say the word of God because the Hebrew letters make words. The Hebrew letters make a word. Right? That's the way the Kabbalists express it. They have a deep study of all of the Hebrew letters. So for them, the way they would say, if their intention is to say, that the foundation, the foundational elements in the empty space, they would call them the letters. So we could, we could say that too, you know, but the New Testament says the word. The New Testament uh, makes it easier. It puts the letters together and calls it the word. All of the Hebrew letters, and the Hebrew letters are infinite. So the word of God is primordial Adam, and the Hebrew word for primordial is kadmon. I'm trying to say primordial Adam, or ain't what the ancient of days, which we read about in Daniel chapter, Daniel chapter 7, that's the translation in the King James, the ancient of days, the most ancient Adam. He is the one that is the, he is the one that was born into existence and told to reproduce himself on multiple planes of consciousness until, until the visible creation was fully manifested. So he is the word. He is the letters. And you need to know this if you have an opportunity to minister to a Jew. 
Yes, I agree. The letters E were letters were the first thing in the empty space. And those letters fo formed a word. <laughs> those letters formed a word. And the word was primordial Adam. The word was Adam, the creation of God. Adam is the creation of God. And is coming into existence in multiple stages. Jesus is the beginning of the creation of God. We don't know what's about to happen to us, but we see Jesus. What does that mean? It means we're going to be like him. The scripture says we will be like him. I had a friend years ago tell me, who do you think you are saying you're a son of God? Yeah. We're all, the, the church is its own worst enemy. See? We have to be willing to believe that God has a similar experience for us. What does that mean? That we'll be glorified in the, at the end. Okay? The end of the process is deliverance from this flesh that is a big problem. Maybe you're young and it's not a problem for you yet, but let me tell you, this body is a problem. Eventually it becomes a problem because it's, it's, not, it's, it's not what God intended it to be. This body is supposed to be serving the spirit man. See, it's not supposed to be holding us back see, or, or, or bringing, um, bringing experiences into our life that hinder our spiritual growth. That's the curse of being fallen, you see, that we have to overcome. Okay, so the word of God is primordial Adam. He is the seal. He's the seal that the angel or the man with the inkhorn writer in Ezekiel is going forth with and stamping all of the, all of the believers. We're getting sealed with Adam Kimon. His image, because he is in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's the, he's the image of God. So he's planting his image on our soul. See? So he's the original, the metal, the metal seal that when you press it in the clay, the clay actually is a mirror image of the seal. It can't be exactly the same because the seal protrudes. You put it in the clay, if I put a finger in the clay, there's going to be a hole in the clay. And maybe the, the outline of the hole will look like my finger, but my finger is not, my finger is, is, a, is solid, it's going to put a hole in the clay. Okay. So with the, the footprints, with the footprints of primordial Adam, he is the reality. Everything beyond himself is created. And part of him is created. The, the six branches are created. But at his essence, he's the, he's the infinite point, which is not created. So he's the word. That was the first thing that was in the empty space. Now, the, the, the Gospel of John doesn't put it that way. It just says, in the beginning was the word. But it doesn't talk about the empty space. See, everything in the New Testament is in the Old Testament, if you can get it. The, the, the scripture is infinite. The Torah is infinite. Everything's in there, but you need the mind of God or the authority of God to extract the information. Because man is man is that infinite. Man is finite. We're limited. See, so only when God authorizes you, gives you the authority to dig out this truth, can you find it. And that was one of the challenges that I gave to the rabbi in one of our rare meetings. I said, you tell me that the Torah is infinite? He said, yes. I said, well, isn't it possible that the New Testament is true? Is, is that not possible? You say it's infinite and God, everything's in there. And his answer to me, his answer to me was, was very interesting. He said, yes, it's possible, except that everything has to be, con there has to be a thread of consistency. There has to be something that attaches a foundational principle that runs through the Old and the New Testament. And, and the Jews claim that we don't have it. And the, the reason they claim we don't have it is that the doctrine in the church is wrong. The doctrine in the church is wrong. So they reject the New Testament. So his, his response to me was legitimate. The question is, what will they do when they hear the doctrine of Christ? See? And that's what's happening now. In a very, 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 very slow process, 
of me being involved in this synagogue and, and I don't even have that much material that I can give them. I don't give them material that talks about Jesus. I just give them my Old Testament work, which has the spirit of Jesus on it. See? So that's all I could do. The Lord has to do it. But what I'm trying to tell you is that everything in the New Testament is in the Old Testament in seed form. It's buried or it's as big as life if your mind can recognize it. But the mind of a human, Jew or otherwise, will not recognize it unless the Spirit of God rests upon that person and illuminates their mind to recognize it, which is what happened to Paul and the other apostles. So what I'm telling you, brethren, it's, it's the purpose of what I'm telling you today is to humble you. You should never, ever, ever reject anything on first hearing. You should never reject people because of what they're thinking or believing. You have to, first of all, if you want, if you want all that God has to offer, you need to love the truth. That has to be your primary goal in your studies, is truth. If that's not your primary goal, then you need to confess it is sin and ask the Lord to help you. And once your primary goal is an acquisition or knowledge of the truth, for what reason to please God, to be one with God? Your motive has to be God, not to be a great teacher, but to love God and to be, to have him pleased with, with you. That needs to be your motive. If that's not your motive, you need to confess it is sin and ask God to help you. Then you question everything that you hear. Lord, that doesn't sound right to me. What do you have to say? I really can't receive that, Lord. What do you have to say? Lord, please don't let me believe a lie. Don't let me believe a lie, Lord, because one lie, you go off and your whole trajectory changes. This is your goal over here. You're walking steadily towards the goal. You believe one lie, and your whole trajectory changes. And no matter how spiritual you get, you're missing the point because your whole trajectory has changed. So you become an extremely spiritual person, but you never attain eternal life. That's the testimony of the Jews today. Their trajectory, they, they went off, their trajectory is off. So they're going round and round and round with their, their brilliant, brilliant scholars and brilliant knowledge. and They're brilliant. And they don't have eternal life. They don't have a perspective, a prospect of eternal life that I have, that you have. And brethren, I haven't arrived either. The rabbi blew my mind the other night. I had to go before God and say, Lord, what is wrong with me? The issue of the sea scrolls came up. The, the, um, not the sea scrolls. Uh, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls, yeah. And uh, I'm all into the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's where the Book of Enoch came from. That's where the Book of Giants came from. And I don't doubt. I, that they're, that they're a God, the ENT the is incredible. And what's amazing is that they seem to prove that it came before Christ's birth. There's, there's much that lines up with the book of Revelation in it, and it's very exciting. The, the book of Enoch, anyway. The book of Giants is fascinating, too. So I was surprised to hear. It never occurred to me, never occurred to me, and this is why I'm saying, Lord, what's wrong with me? I'm always telling you, ask questions, ask questions, ask questions, and I didn't ask the questions. It never occurred to me to ask the rabbi, what do the Jewish authorities think about the Dead Sea Scrolls? And of course, they don't, he never told me, they don't, they don't accept the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I said to him, why? And his answer blew me away. And the reason that it blew me away is that I never thought of that. I don't like finding myself in this position that I'm always rebuking you, where's the question, where's the question? And I didn't ask the question. Okay. I said, why don't they accept it? He said, well, first of all, you have to ask, why were they buried? Did you ask why the Dead Sea Scrolls were buried? Mm -hmm. Or did we just assume that they were preserved by some well-meaning Essene that wanted to save them? We drew a conclusion. Mm -hmm. But the Jewish mind said, why were they buried? Because the law is that you can't once once you have a document or a scroll with the name of God on it, he said, you can't, you can't destroy it. You can't burn it or destroy it. But he said it, it was not unusual to have mistakes made. 
He said the scribes that repeated, that wrote these scrolls, he said they weren't, they were not scholars, they were just scribes. And there were a lot of mistakes. So once if there was a mistake on the scroll, they retired it, but they buried it because <laughs> you can't burn it or put it in a garbage pail. And I just said, I mean, I don't know that, I, that that's what happened, but what blew me away was that I didn't even ask the question. Never asked him if the Jewish authorities received it. And, and then when the answer was no, I was just flabbergasted that there was a thought, there was a stream of thought that I was completely blind to. See, and this is what happened to me when God put me in this rabbi's classes. It wasn't so much what I learned there, although I learned a lot of, I think, very valuable truth there. It changed my whole life because it opened up my mind to a different way of thinking, which I have applied to, to my to understanding the scripture, which has resulted in the great messages that have come forth here. See? And here's a whole stream of thinking that com I was completely blind to. See? I want to be around people that are going to affect me this way. I hope this never happens to me again. Everything that happens, I need to ask why. I'm telling you, please don't make, stop making these assumptions. Why were they buried? Now, after I went home and, and prayed about it, my personal opinion is that I may have heard this from the Lord, is that the primary reason that the Jewish authorities have rejected the Dead Sea Scrolls, especially the Book of Enoch, because it sounds just like the Book of Revelation. See? And they have rejected the Book of Revelation. They've rejected the whole New Testament. So if that is true, if that is true, if that is the reason, because you know they're the modern-day Pharisees, if that is the reason that they have rejected the Dead Sea Scrolls, so if that is the true reason, then that's not good. That's not a good thing for their, for their spiritual life, you know. Um, so anyway, let me get on with our message for today. Our motives have to be truth at any price. Truth at any price. Because even if that price damages your personal life, Overall, your life will improve when you, have, when you live a life of truth. Truth about your own motives. Truth about the people that you love. Are you, willing to, are you willing to face the truth about your parents, about your husband, about your wife? Do you idolize your parents? Have you ever grown up? Did you ever come to the realization that your parents were just two people <laughs> out there that did good and bad things? and that might have done things in their youth that would shock you. you know, they're just people. Did you, have you come to that conclusion yet, or are you still a child in your mind? Truth about yourself, truth about your parents, truth about your siblings, truth about your heroes, whoever they might be, truth about your country. Do you have to stop loving your country because aspects of your government did bad things? No, that's, that's called maturity, you see. You have to stop loving your parents because you found out something that you're shocked that your father did that or your mother did that. It's called maturity. You don't stop loving them, you see. You love them anyway with their imperfections and, and with the, the things that they did that you disapprove of or that, are, that you're disappointed in. It's called maturity. That's how you survive marriage for 50 years, you see. Truth. Truth and acceptance of the whole person. Otherwise you get sick. When you're in denial, it eats away at you. It eats away at your gut. It makes you sick. You become a bitter person or a sick person, physically sick person. We somewhere along the line make a decision to commit adultery or do, do something that's foolish. Because you're not, you have not faced the truth about your mate and what you may be contributing to the problem, okay? Are you one of these people? Are you one of these people that when somebody misbehaves, when they mistreat you, are you one of these people that never look at yourself and say, why did they yell at me like that? What a nasty person that they yelled at me. Did you ever ask yourself what you might have done? what you might have said, no matter how quietly you said it, 
that provoked them. There's no, no excuse for their bad behavior. Mm -hmm. But do you ever look at yourself and ask what you did that provoked that kind of behavior? That kind of truth is what is required of you to go on with God. You want longevity, you want eternal life. That's the price. The price of your naivety is the price of your mental and spiritual virginity. You're not going on into longevity with these lies in your mind, you see. They won't go. They won't get through the keyhole. They won't go. They won't fit in, see. They'll hold you back. That's the kind of truth we're talking about. Are you up to it? A lot of people are not up to it. If you're not up to it, but you want to be up to it, then you confess it is sin and ask Jesus to make you up to it. See, there's no excuse. Since Jesus was glorified, there's no excuse. But we all, we all get what we really want. Are you really in touch with your inner person? Do you, are you really facing what you really want? Are you facing the truth or are you lying to yourself? If you don't know, yes, the Lord. Am I lying to myself? Am I really facing my own motives and who I am and what I am? Because, brethren, if you don't do that, if you don't do that, there's no way that you can judge your own sins. If you are not honest with yourself about who you are and what you really want out of life, and your relationship with God, and your relationship with everybody that you have a relationship with, if you're not honest about yourself, you will not see sin in yourself. And then if someone like me points it out to you, mm -hmm. you will get mad at me. And I don't see the Lord forcing anyone to do this at this time. Now someone here might say, well, that's not true, he's forcing me. Well, he goes according to your motive. Maybe you don't know what your own motive is. Maybe your reality is that when push comes to shove, if, you were, if your back were up was against the wall, mm -hmm you would serve God. Maybe you don't realize that right now. So he's dealing with you on that level. He's dealing with you as a person that he knows in the crisis you would choose him. But at the moment, you know, you're not happy with certain things. Do you know who you are? He's not forcing anyone, as far as I know at this time, to go into this level of truth. That's why our numbers are so few. How, how many people can do this? Do you know people can't do this? They can't face, the, face this kind of truth. They can't even face the truth of what's going on in the world. Now this whole, this last, leg, this Las Vegas incident, the government is becoming less and less credible. It looks like it was a false flag. We're not even really sure what the truth is, yet the guy was, was in the Middle East. ISIS says he converted to Islam six months ago. Another ex-CIA agent is saying he's a, he's a CIA asset. Someone else is saying the guy laying on the floor, the picture of the guy laying on the floor in the pool of blood, that it wasn't him. That if you look at his eye in the picture, his eye is green. You look at the picture of the man before he died and his eyes are brown. What do you believe? I, he, there was no way he was a lone shooter, that's for sure. See? Do you believe there's a rogue government? Do you believe that there's a, a shadow government opposing the elected government? If you can't, that's where you have to start. You have to start with the obvious. Start with the obvious. How are you ever going to face what's in your own heart if you're not facing the obvious? That there are treasonous enemies in our government today. And they're entrenched. And that there are some people that are fighting to save the country. And there are others a lot of them Christians that are fighting against the people that are fighting to save the country because you're stupid and ignorant. And if you're insulted, that's too bad. Stop being stupid and stop being ignorant and ask God to open your eyes. So let's take a look at these notes, okay? We're going to just, I'm going to just read through them pretty quickly unless I see that it's something that I didn't touch on last week. So it started with... Uh, an email from an unidentified person, which I will not read to you. So starting on page two, it says the questions begin here, in the middle of page two. 
and I put some headings in to help us. Is the word referring to Christ? And my answer, the Greek word logos, translated word, means the thought, that's God's will, and the manifestation of that thought. God had a thought to bring creature into existence that would benefit and appreciate his, mag his magnanimity, his greatness, his, his, his generosity. The process of creation would begin with a revelation of himself as a means of, it should be communication, as a means of communication with the creature. We are the creature, creation, creature. Same thing. God's name is a revelation of his nature, which is infinite. Understanding God's nature, to whatever degree we can understand it, helps us to recognize God when he speaks from behind the veil of humanity. You have to try the spirit, brethren. You should be trying the spirit continuously. The words can fool you. Words can cause you consternation. Words can upset you. Words may sound wrong to you but you need the ability to discern the spirit. You discern the spirit of God that's speaking the words, then you really better investigate whether or not your emotional reaction to those words is wrong. Maybe your negative emotional reaction to those words is wrong. Why, well, why would that be? Because it's, it's uh, affecting your personal, those words, if they're true, would affect your personal life in a negative way. So you don't want to believe them. That's the kind of thing we have to overcome to go on with God. The Word of God is a specific revelation of God's nature, a specific thought, one of many thoughts, or one of infinite thoughts, or many thoughts of an infinite God, or many, one, of many, one of infinite thoughts, and its manifestation. The thought is, let us make man. And the manifestation of the thought is the Torah, or the Word of God. Let us make man, and primordial Adam came into existence. Let us make man, and an infinite point appeared, and clothed itself with six branches and a seed. God's, God's name is God. Okay? He said, I and my name are one. God's name is God. So um, what I'm trying to do here is distinguish between the Word and His name. So I'm saying that God's name is a primordial Adam, is His name. His nature, the manifestation of His nature, that's primordial Adam. So what's the difference between His name and the Word? And I'm saying that the Word is a specific manifestation of His name. And the specific manifestation of His name is in the form of a, of a man, primordial Adam. But his name is beyond that. I don't, I don't want to go beyond that right now. I try to spend some time meditating on that last night. And I just, I, God didn't give me anything. So this is, this, is, this is what we're doing today. God's name is his word for us, for our study today. God's name, his nature is manifested in his word. You want to know what God's name is? His name is the whole Bible. And you know, that's hard to understand. I heard that years ago that his name is the whole Bible, and I never really understood that. How could his name be all of the letters of the Bible? I didn't understand it. Well, at least the, the level on which I understand it today is this. For you to know God's name, you have to learn the Bible. You have to have a working knowledge of the Bible. What is the Bible? It's a, it's, it's a series of stories and prophecies that really reveal the contrast between righteousness and evil or right and wrong. So the, this, this, this Bible is our ability to see the contrast between good and evil, right and wrong. And everything that's good and everything that's right and righteous is God. So that's how you see God's name, by the contrast with wrong and evil. In that way, the whole Bible is God's name. It's a, it's a, it's a, a way of understanding God and his righteousness. God is righteousness. He is perfect righteousness in everything he does. And as far as we creatures are concerned, that applies to other, other human beings. 
He is perfectly righteous in the way he deals with his creation, humanity. So if we want to be like God, if we want to go on to longevity and immortality, we need to deal with our fellow humans the way God deals with us. How does God deal with us, in a nutshell? How does he deal with us? He doesn't punish us for punishment's sake. But there are, there are legitimate consequences for everything that we do. And this is a foundational law in this world. So we don't have to be punishing people, brethren. There are legitimate consequences for what people do. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You don't let people hurt you. And in extreme circumstances, it's not ideal, but in extreme circumstances, you might have to break the relationship completely. In extreme circumstances. You should do your best to reconcile with the person. You don't have to be best friends with them. You don't have to be seeing them every day of your life. But, but you should do your best to dissolve the hostility, dissolve the, the resentment, and bless each other and go your separate ways. See, that's what God requires of us. And then the law of God deals with each individual, because no one's perfectly right. You know, I guess in, in, in certain, certain, certain circumstances, um, it's possible, if you're, if you're really living for God, that you could be righteous in the circumstance. But with the average people, most people, there was some sin on your part. Did you have a wrong thought in, in your heart? For one moment, did you desire vengeance against them? Were you really perfect in your ministry to them, that you never ever considered vengeance for them and said, oh no, vengeance is mine, save the Lord? Well, that was your part, and that's what you need to confess. Did you ever rejoice that something bad happened to them? That's a fine line, brethren. Rejoicing over something bad happening to somebody, and rejoicing because you see that God's justice is valid. I've struggled with that for years. I've seen people experience judgment, and I've been excited. And uh, this is how I believe the Lord explained it to me. I'm excited to see that God's justice is real. And then that helps me have a godly fear of God. This sowing and reaping justice is real. You better be careful how you treat, how you treat your brother, see? Because this sowing and reaping is real. So uh, I rejoice when I see the reality of God's judgment, but I don't rejoice in the person's pain. And I hope that this righteous judgment will bring them to repentance. But if God's, if, if the, if, look, if the Bible isn't true, what am I doing here? What am I doing here if it's not true? And the Bible says, every sin shall have its just recompense. And whatever you sow, you shall reap. So I'm happy to see that the Bible is true. And I ask God to help me to, to be honest in my dealings with my fellow man, that that shouldn't happen to me. See, there's no fear in the world today. There's no fear in the Western world today. There's no fear. You can do anything you want. There's no fear. And half the country is sick or divorced or on drugs. I read on Drudge, I don't know what state it was in, but there was a, a medical examiner that there were so many, so many corpses from heroin overdoses that he couldn't take it anymore. He quit his job. And the, and the, the sowing and reaping is not always necessarily on you. It could be on your children or your grandchildren. So I rejoice when I see the justice of God and it gives me hope. It gives me hope. Because he also said when you do good, he's going to bless you for a thousand generations. So if the, if the bad justice is true, then the good justice is true. And it helps me, because I'm a sinner. You know? It helps me to walk the straight path. So, God's name is God. God's name is God, and his appearance in this world is the word, the scripture. He is the spiritual reality of the message of the scripture. In other words, the scripture is a word picture of God and his name, and the two are one and the same.
and the two are one and the same that both bars are going to be. <sighs> Susan, these mistakes are all in the book, so they would have to be corrected in the book. And now we're talking about the image of God. Adam, the mankind, is the image of God's name. He is the one who was made to think God's thoughts and speak God's words always. He is a spiritual man that is not homo sapien. We are homo sapien. Mankind, humanity, as we know ourselves, we are homo sapien. Okay? The sapien species of homo, which is man. And, and Adam is not man as we know him today. He's a spiritual man. His name is Adam. We are not Adam. See? Anyone that's teaching you that humanity today is Adam is mistaken. We are not Adam. We are homo sapien. The first Adam sinned and died, and the second Adam, the Lord from heaven, cannot die. He is invincible. Okay. Now, Adam is being regenerated today, and that regeneration is inside of us. He is a spiritual man. He is regenerating inside of homo sapiens. We are homo sapiens. Adam is rising from the dead in us, and his name is now the second. As he rises from the dead in us, he has to be male and female. That means the male aspect of Christ has to be added to us in order for us to call ourselves mankind. And we can call ourselves mankind because mankind is inside of us. We are in this clay body. We are homo sapien. Okay. Now I gave a whole exhortation earlier how the female side of Adam is imparted and forms the Holy Spirit in us, which marries our soul and forms the mind of Christ in us. And then when the Lord Jesus joins, with the mind of Christ in us, and we are now male and female, and become Christ Jesus, okay, the second Adam, and then we can call ourselves mankind. So we're still humanity down here, in the process of being returned to mankind. So the second Adam is the Lord from heaven, and he cannot die, and I give you a scripture on that. If you can receive it, the spiritual man, the second Adam, who was replacing the first Adam, who died because of sin, was inside of the human being called Jesus of Nazareth. He was Jesus of Nazareth's inner man. And there's a scripture for that. Just like Christ is our inner man today. And there's a scripture for you, Christ in you. Indeed, it is Christ who is the image of God. Adam called Christ, which means anointed, is the spiritual man or the image that thinks God's thoughts and speaks God's words always. Now, I think I mentioned this on, on Thursday. I didn't feel to go into it on this study, but when we read about the image of the beast, it's the same principle. The, the beast is a spiritual man. And his image is a, is a, his image is a mind. His image is a spiritual man. The, the beast is a spiritual entity, and the image of the beast is a spiritual man. And his name is Lucifer. God's shape. God is so great that he has a shape that talks. And we're told that the image of the beast talks. So the image of the beast is a spiritual man that's inside of a homo sapien. And the homo sapien, the, the human that the beast mind is inside of, speaks the words of that, of that beast mind. And that is the developed carnal mind. It's not necessarily the carnal mind of the average person out there, but the beast is the, is the developed carnal mind that's joined to a, an unholy seed that has become, uh, something has been born in that person like, like Christ, like the Christ mind is born in us. It's the seed from the other side that births a, a, mature, Christ, a mature bestial mind that is evil that likes blood, that likes to see people hurt, that wants to offer sacrifices to Satan, an evil mind. You know, there, there, there have been a lot of arrests of pedophilia. You know, they find children in cages. You know, children kidnapped and kept in cages. Evil, brethren, evil, true evil. God's shape. Is that what I'm up to, God's shape? God is so great that he has a shape that talks. I have a scripture for you. God's shape is God's invisible image inside of a form. The form is a human being, and the shape is the mind of God, which is a blend of Christ, the image of God, and the soul or the personality of the man. I gave you a whole exhortation on that just half an hour ago. That's what's being trained up. That's what... 
That's what is of God, but can make mistakes. Sometimes the people of this world think that the human form that the shape of God appears in is God. And I will read the scripture, that scripture, Acts 14, verses 11 and 12. And when the people saw that what Paul had done, Paul had done a miracle, he, had, he helped a cripple to walk. Someone who was crippled from birth stood up and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. So we may not have anybody today thinking that the people who do miracles in Jesus' name are gods, you know. But that's the danger. They may, they, they may not be calling themselves gods, but if you receive worship from people, then, then you're calling yourself, you're, you're in a subtle way calling yourself God. When you have miracle working power, it's very dangerous to let people uh, idolize you like that. That's what Herod did, and the scripture says he was eaten of worms. What does that mean? It meant that this, uh, the, brethren, you, you cannot be a king or a leader of men without spiritual power. You just, you just can't. So that spiritual man that was inside of Herod that gave him what he needed. He was appointed by the Romans, I believe, to be the, the head of Israel, or the Tetrarch. I'm not, not sure what the, the titles were. Never got into that very much. He had authority over Judah. He was their leader. Was he actually a king? I don't know. They called him king or not. You don't get, a, you don't get into a position like that without spiritual power. Because that spiritual power includes the wisdom to rule. So when the scripture says he was eaten of worms, worms, it means he lost his ability to rule. And once you lose your ability to rule, then it's, it's very quickly, brethren, this, is, this world is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. You have any kind of position of power, you have any kind of power, and you lose that power, there are spiritual dogs out there, human beings that have a, that have a soul that is like a dog, that they will recognize your weakness in a, in a flash. And they will be there to take what you can no longer handle. They'll be there like moths come to a flame. And they'll strip you of everything that you have. So that when the scripture says that Herod was eaten of worms, he lost his spiritual power to rule. And the end of it was that eventually he was replaced in that office. See, that's how God works. He doesn't necessarily kill your body. He takes back what he gave you spiritually, and then the, the deterioration of your life begins, and ultimately it ends in death, because today we all die anyway. But, you know, how you die is important. How you die is important. Now, we'll, we'll, we're going to come to it soon. I gave you an example of King Josiah. Well, why don't we just get to it? Let's get to it. Well, I'll just say this, okay. I, king Josiah was a great king. He was the, the grandson of possibly the most evil king that there was. Okay, he restored the Passover. He was a great and a beloved king. And he died in battle. See? Now, I've given you, that's the exhibit. We're not going to read the exhibit, but it's the story of King Josiah. And the man who wrote this article, he, he doesn't draw a conclusion as to why Josiah died in, in battle, you know. And uh, it's interesting because I just heard this in my daily devotions yesterday and, and as I was listening to the, this event in the Book of Chronicles. The king of Egypt, excuse me, was, was, was crossing Judean lands or lands controlled by Judah and he wanted to, to engage in some kind of battle that had to do with Assyria and Babylon. Yeah. You can get the details by reading it yourself if you're interested. And King Josiah went out and said, you can't, you can't pass through my land. And the king of Egypt said to him, don't stop me. The Lord has sent me on this mission. Now, the Lord has sent me on this mission. Now, we have scriptural proof that God has spoken to Pharaoh in the past. God has spoken to Nebuchadnezzar. God's, brethren, God speaks to all kinds of people, okay? 
He, he will deal with anyone. And what I also found, find very interesting about this account, which I'm not planning on spending much time on it unless the Lord changes my mind, is that it really demonstrates that God is very involved in politics and he's very involved in world events. He's involved beyond the politics of the, the his churches all over the world, but the main hub of it is here in the United States. It's the, the revival started here. Now this move of God is starting here. Now, he's very interested in the whole world, and in particular the leaders of the world. So this king of Egypt says to King Josiah, the Lord has sent me to engage in this conflict going on between Assyria and Babylon. I'm just passing through your land. Don't stop me. The Lord has told me to hurry. And just saw you wouldn't let him through. See? Now I remember what happened when the Hebrew children went into, into Canaan land. And old King Og wouldn't let them through. There were two kings that two Canaanite kings that wouldn't let them through. They said, we just want to pass through. We won't take anything that belongs to you. We won't drink your water. We won't eat anything that belongs to you. We just want to pass through. And they wouldn't let them pass through. And they wound up being destroyed, these two kings, by Israel. So King Josiah wouldn't let him through. He didn't believe him. He didn't believe him. Okay. And he stopped a man that said, let me through. God told me to do this. And he said to hurry. When I heard this, I was listening to, to the audio of my scripture of the Bible the other day. When I heard this, my first thought was, and then I heard that he died. He died on the battlefield. He went, I think he engaged King Echo, aged the Egyptian king in battle, because he didn't want him to pass his land, pass through his land, and he died in that battle. So my first reaction was, well, I, I, and the reason I'm thinking this way is because further on in this message today, we have First John chapter 5, which has a really puzzling uh, part to it in, in verse 20, I believe it is, it says, there is a sin that is unto death, but there is a sin that is not unto death. What is the sin that's unto death? I believe today that the sin that's unto death is if you interfere with what God's doing. See? If you try to stop somebody that is serving God so that they cannot fulfill what he has told them to do, you're, you're risking your life. And I've seen people die. So I've asked the Lord, why did this one die? And why did that one not die? A lot of people have come against this ministry. Why did this one die and why did that one not die? Well, maybe this one had the spiritual power to really hinder what God was doing here. And this person was just playing. See, it's, it's a spiritual manifestation of us reaching out to save the ark. Do you remember David was, was transporting the ark from the Philistines? The Philistines had captured it, and he was transporting the ark back into Judean territory. And they didn't, David did not uh, secure the ark properly. The scripture says that only the Levites, and honestly, I don't know whether it's the Levites or the priests, I'm not sure, that the ark had rings on them, and they were supposed to put long stabs through the rings, and the, there were supposed to be men carrying the ark by holding on to these long poles that went through the rings on the ark. No one was supposed to touch the ark. So David was not transporting the ark properly. It was just on this cart. And the, the, the cart, I mean, they didn't have roads like we have today. The cart stumbled. It looked like it was going to fall. Uzzi reached out to save the ark, and he died. And David was mad at the Lord for killing him. But David was the one that was at fault. He, he ordered the, the ark to be brought back into Judean territory. I think it was Jerusalem, but I'm not sure where he was bringing the ark to. And he didn't, uh, he didn't call the, the Levites or the, the, the uh, priests to do it. So it was really, it was not God's fault that Uzzah died. It was David's fault that Uzzah died. And David was man of God, you see. So, so there's a parallel there, if you can see it. So here is this king telling, uh, not believing a man that says to him, God, I'm not even going to hurt you, you know? Although, from, from King Josiah's point of view, he was afraid that he would let this army onto his land and they were lying and they would attack his people. So, what, what, what's the problem here? The problem is that Josiah didn't ask the Lord. He didn't ask the Lord. 
But my, so there was no doubt in my mind that that was why he died. And it was very strong on me when I was listening to the scripture the other day. And then I pulled out this article for your edification, and this writer is not as convinced as I was, and he's looking at it from different sides. And he said, well, he, he cites all of the events that happened, well, that would not have happened if, if, uh, if, um, king, if Josiah had not stopped the, king from, the Egyptian king from going through. Mm -hmm. Then he cited all the events that did happen after Josiah's death, and he questions, is it possible that God, that God wanted Josiah to block the king of Egypt so that events would turn out this way? And my answer to that is this. I don't believe that if that was the case, that Josiah would have died. This was an ignominious death. This was an, this was an insulting death that the king of Judah died in battle. This is a sign that God is not with you. That's not how you die when God just wants to take you out of the way for his own purposes. If you've served God and you did these great works and God is really pleased with you, he doesn't take your life by having you die in battle. See, so. Uh, so my conclusion is that this great king died because he stopped an, uh, another soldier with his army who was serving God, and he stopped him when he shouldn't have stopped him. Now what you, what you need, and I've told you this before, what you all need to know, brethren, this is really important, you need to know this, that there is no good work that you have ever done or no collection of good works that you have done if you've spent your whole life doing everything perfectly, which is not possible, but if it were possible, that all of that would not save you in the hour that you disobey God. <laughs> or in the hour that you make a mistake like that. In the hour that somebody says to you, God sent me and told me to do this, and you don't believe it, and you oppose them. There isn't any good work you've done in your life that can counteract that terrible mistake that you have made. Don't ever forget it. Don't ever forget it. So this author, he says, well, King Josiah, he didn't have time to ask God. Well, he didn't have time to ask God, and he paid for it with his life. See? Now, in those days, to ask God, you had to go to the prophet, you had to go to the priest, you had to put on the urim and the thurum. Um, He died an anonymous death. Okay. To me, there's no question he made the wrong decision. And I honestly don't know if in that day it would have been valid to simply say, Lord, what do you want me? I guess it would not have been valid to say, what do you want me to do? There wasn't that, per that, that personal relationship wasn't there. He would have had to have gone to a prophet or the priest. Well, he paid with his life. Yeah. So that's my position in case you don't understand it. If God did kill him because he wanted events to play out the way they did, he would have given him an honorable death. That was not an honorable death, being defeated in battle. So you need to know that God will treat you honorably when you're honorable. So anyway, on with this message. The Son of God. And, and the, the point is that there is a sin unto death. That's, you, you, will, you will die. It's not God up there with lightning bolts. Okay, you come against the anointing and you're risking your life. You come against the anointing and you're risking your life. Sometimes you die physically right away, Josiah died in battle, and sometimes your life starts to wane and it can take 20 years for you to die. 20 years of, of spiritual loss. Spiritual, 20, 10 years or however many years of things getting worse and worse and worse in your life until you die. That's the sin that's unto death. Don't get, don't get your face into God's plans. The Son of God. The Lord Jesus Christ above joined to Christ, the image of God in the earth, is called the Son of God. So the mind of God, the mind of Christ in us is the man-child, the Son of God is the Lord Jesus Christ above, joined to, this is even wrong, not, not joined to Christ, the image of God, but joined to the mind of God. 
the Lord Jesus Christ above joined to the mind of God in the earth is called the Son of God. So we now know the difference between the man-child and the Son of God. The Son of God is the nature of God born in a human being and is male and female. Let me say that. The Son of God is the, is the nature of God, male, well, the Son of God is male and female. The nature of God, born in a human being. The Son of God is Adam. Adam is male and female. The mind of Christ in us is only female. So you cannot say that he's the Son of God. Okay. He is the man-child. I believe he's, uh, he's Metatron in the, in the Zohar. Sometimes he's called the lad, a lad, the young man. Okay. He's not quite Adam yet. The Son of God pleases God always, but is not God. He is the Son of God. So now we have the man-child, or the lad, or Metatron, and then we have the Son of God. Okay. But he is not God. He is not God. The Son of God has the nature of God born in a human being. The Son of God pleases God always, but is not God. And I have a couple of scriptures for you there. And the reason I'm hesitating is I'm trying to get my thoughts together here. The Son of God, okay, the Lord Jesus joined to the mind of Christ in us. There is, in, is not alone, okay, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, excuse me, the Lord Jesus Christ is not alone. He is joined to the Shekinah. The Lord Jesus, the glorified Jesus Christ, okay, who is the Son of God, the six sephirot in the Midat, the six, script, the six scriptures, the six sephirot in the middle of the ten, okay, he is joined to his mother, who's in the third degree of power, up just above him. So when the, when the Lord Jesus Christ joins with the mind of Christ in us, Okay, that is the Son of God. He's called Christ Jesus in us. Mm -hmm. But the presence of the mother, the Shekinah, makes it God flowing through us. Let me make sure you understand that. The Lord Jesus Christ, which is the Son of God, joins with the mind of Christ in us, and Christ Jesus comes into existence in us. And that is this, that we can then be called the Son of God, because the Son of God is in us. But we're not God, okay? But the mother is attached to the Lord Jesus Christ. Bina, okay, I'm gonna, I have scriptures on that future. She is understanding. She flows through the Lord Jesus Christ, down through the mind of Christ in us, and that is God in us. God in us. The Son of God is not God, but the mother flows through him, and together they are Elohim, God. So once that unification takes place, that the Lord Jesus Christ joins with the mind of Christ in us, Inside of us is the Son of God, and also inside of us is God. And that is longevity right there, that the spirit of life, which is the mother, flows through us. Do you understand what I just said? You all understand what I just said? You are not God. You are not even Adam. Okay? You are the clay. But we enter into the inheritance of Adam when we flow with him and think like he does and do as he does. So I'm at the top of page five. Does that mean that Jesus is God, although separate? When Jesus said the Father and I are one, it was the Son of God, the second Adam, speaking through the man Jesus. So the answer is no. And then she asked the question, Genesis 1.26 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Who is God referring to as us and our, if not Jesus and the Holy Spirit? And she says, I think the angels and other God. My answer is, God is speaking to his name, the manifestation of his will to produce an image of himself. In other words, God was speaking to the very foundation upon which Adam, the image he willed to appear, would be built. Because that... That Adam Kamon, okay, that, that infinite point that extended itself into six branches and then sowed a female seed, okay, 
is producing an image of itself in the lower worlds. Question 3a. Okay, now this is really important, and I didn't have this answer. This I learned, and I'm really excited to learn this. John 14, 26 says, but the con see, I've been saying for years that I've been saying for years that the comforter is not the Holy Spirit, that the comforter is the spirit of truth, and they're not the same. And I would show you, if you asked me, I would show you John 15, 26, which says, But when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of Truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. I would show you that scripture and say it's not the Holy Spirit, it's the Spirit of Truth or the Spirit of Christ. And I never really realized until this woman asked me this question and put out these scriptures that, this, the, that the scripture also talks about the Comforter being the Holy Ghost. John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I have said to you. Or I looked at it in the interlinear text. I somehow, somehow I got past that and claimed that the comforter was only the spirit of truth. So here's her question. Are the spirit of truth, the comforter, and the Holy Ghost one and the same? And they're not. But my, the way I explained it was wrong, so now I have the correct explanation for you. The Holy Ghost is called the Spirit of Promise because it carries the seed, that's the female seed, by which God's promise can be fulfilled. Let's say female seed. This seed is the female seed of Adam, who is both male and female. The Holy Spirit of Promise is called the Comforter because the promise of salvation comforts God's people who are spiritually female. They, they receive the promise of salvation. They're told that they're saved because their spirit is saved, and they're comforted. The spirit of truth is the spirit of the glorified Jesus Christ, which carries Adam's male seed. He is also called the comforter because hearing the truth about God and his plans for us comfort us as we experience the trials and tribulations of this world. This truth is in the form of esoteric doctrine, the mysteries of the scripture. So then she goes on to ask, if they are, Jesus said he would send them from the Father, but that they proceed out of the Father. Well, if what I'm, she, she just wants to know if they're separate. She's all into the, into the Trinity. We're going past that right now. I go on further to expound the next paragraph where I say, Jesus said that the Father would send the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, in his name, but that he would send the Holy Spirit that comes from the Father. Read the two scriptures. Look at the play on it. You can see it for yourself. On page 5. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. John 15, 26. But the, when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father. So when the Father is sending and when he is sending, so what does this mean? Jesus said that the Father would send the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, in his name, but that he would send the Holy Spirit that comes from the Father. These are two different impartations of the Spirit of God, each of which is a different, has a different function. The Holy Spirit of promise will bring to memory all the things that Jesus said into it. And of course, I have rearranged the words of that scripture. Okay. John 14, 26 says, He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. But that's not true. The Holy Spirit does not teach you all things. There's no spirit of truth in the Holy Spirit. There's no esoteric doctrine. I spent years in the Holy Ghost Church. There's no spirit of truth, okay? There's some, some, depending, there are some teachers that teach a good teaching on the letter of the word. There's no spiritual teaching there. So this has to be wrong. So I looked at the interlinear text, and it's just uh, that, with that, that the way those words were put together is simply the King James translators, and I posit to you that they are wrong, and that the translation should be, the Holy Spirit of promise will bring to memory all the things that Jesus has said and taught. And Jesus wasn't teaching deep doctrine. Jesus was teaching that you should, you should love your brother. 
that you should love God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul, and you should love your brother. Jesus was teaching that the law, he was the end of the law. Jesus was teaching the Pharisees that the, the law of ordinances was over. Jesus wasn't teaching the esoteric doctrine. Okay. So the correct translation, and this should really go in the interlinear text, I guess. The Holy Spirit of promise will bring to memory all the things that Jesus said and taught. Not that he's going to teach you everything, okay? You're not ready to learn everything. You have to get the mind of Christ first. Okay. And the Holy Spirit comes before the mind of Christ. So it can't possibly be true, that translation. The Holy Spirit of promise will bring to memory all the things that Jesus said and taught. The Spirit of truth will testify of Jesus. That's what he said right there, right? John 13, 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. How did the Holy Spirit testify of Jesus? He didn't. Because the people that have the Holy Spirit, their nature is still unchanged. That's actually given the church a really a black eye in many instances, especially when preachers have a big following and speak in tongues and cast out demons, sin. It's usually sexual trouble that they get into, usually. Sometimes it's money, but it's usually sex problems. They give the whole church a black eye. The Holy Spirit does not bring righteousness. So the Spirit of Truth will testify of Jesus. What does that mean? The person who has the Spirit of Truth will have Jesus' testimony. The word testimony means martyr. The fallen nature of man that receives the spirit of truth will be martyred. Not your physical body, your fallen nature, your old, you're the first Adam in you, your old man. He will be martyred by the second Adam when the second Adam appears as that man's new righteous mind. When the second Adam appears in you, brethren, his job is to fully put an end to the first Adam. And if you, if you remember the teaching, which actually came forth associated with the incense, when the second Adam appears, he is burning the first Adam. The first Adam that's in you and in me is the female side of the first Adam. She's a fallen woman. She's an adulteress, and the judgment is that she should be burnt. So when the second Adam appears in you, which is a whole process, okay, you have to receive the Holy Spirit, you have to, it has to marry your soul, you have to have the mind of Christ developed in you, you have to have years you have to spend years training up the mind of Christ in you, which is the spiritual child, okay? And there are many scriptures that, that talk about that, that there's a paraclete, there's a, you know, a spirit that's training up the child in us, okay? Then that child has to marry his father, the Lord Jesus Christ, so that the second Adam comes into existence, and that the Shekinah is present so that the authority of the second, that the second Adam comes to you under the authority of the Shekinah, so that he, he's, now he has the authority of God, and he's going to burn up your first man to a crisp so that, that he can't sin through you anymore. And it's really a she. <laughs> so to have the spirit of Christ, you have to be in the process of exposing and warring against your old man. We're talking about the hidden sins of the heart. We're talking about what we do here. We're talking about ungodly motives that seep into your consciousness, that if you can't see it yourself, I have to tell you. That's all your old man. She's in your mind. She is your mind. She's your carnal mind. It's the destruction of the carnal mind. It's the carnal mind that's being burned up. But that doesn't happen until the mind of Christ is fully established in you and, and controlling the body. You don't want to destroy your carnal mind before the Christ mind is in full control of your body. You'll die or you'll lose your mind. So we see that there's a big difference between the comforter that's the Holy Ghost and the comforter that's the Spirit of Truth. There's a radical difference. But Jesus calls them both the comforter. So there are two different grades of the Spirit of God. So I'm saying there's only one God, I'm at the top of page 7. There's only one God, he is not triune. Hero Israel, the Lord your God is one God. 
uh, does, does Jesus have the authority to tell God the Father what to do? I have to laugh at that question, but there were people who were teaching that at this time. This, these questions originally came forth in 1998. There were people teaching that at that time. My answer is no one has the authority to tell God what to do. So she's saying, in light of Matthew 11:27, which says, all things are delivered unto me of the Father. My answer, Jesus clearly said that we cannot be greater than the one who gave us power. John 15, 20. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. 1 Corinthians 15, 27. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. The one who gave Jesus the power is not subject to Jesus. No matter how great Jesus gets, he's not greater than the one who gave him power. And no matter how great we get, okay, we may, we all have the potential to be as great as Jesus was in the days of his flesh, but we will never overtake him because he is the one that gave us our experience and our power. We'll never be greater than him. The word things is not in the Greek. It was added by the King James translators. The word whole signifies the whole Adam, and the whole Adam consists of Adam, the image of God who was in heaven, and the Son of God born into a human being in the earth of a human being. And I guess I should add that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one is the Lord Jesus. Jesus was declaring that the whole Adam, the second man, is the Lord from heaven, who is the Lord from heaven, was being revealed through his earthen personality. This reality made Jesus a supernatural man with miracle-working power. He was also declaring that the same experience would be available to all of humanity after he was glorified. And she's questioning Acts 3.21, which says, And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. And my answer is, the scripture is translated incorrectly. No man knoweth the Son but the Father. That's a problem. If the Father is the only one that knows the Son, we're told we cannot know the Father. The Son is the mediator that helps us to know the Father. So if, the, if you can't recognize the Son unless you have the Father, you can't have the Father unless you have the Son. So it has to be translated incorrectly, brethren. It doesn't make any sense at all. So the scripture is translated incorrectly. Jesus was saying that it is impossible for mortal man to recognize or have intimacy with the Father unless the Son of God is born in him. And the Son of God, once again, is first you have to have the mind of Christ, married to the Lord Jesus Christ, okay, brings the Son of God into existence. And the Son of God is one with his mother, who is the spirit of life, the Shekinah. And that is a person with supernatural miracle working power. <clears throat> of the apostle, in, with regard to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, with regard to Acts 4.30, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. I had a little confusion as to what that meant on Thursday, so I'm leaving it in for today. The apostle is asking that miracles be done by the spiritual child who is the offspring of the, of the name of God that was born in Jesus of Nazareth, by whose holiness Jesus overcame the power of death and became invincible or glorified and can never die again. The spiritual child, which is the offspring of the name of God. Well, it's true that, that Christ and all of the aspects of himself are the offspring of the name of God, which is Adam, primordial Adam. No mortal man can recognize the Father or the Son when either is hidden behind human flesh. Only the Son of God in one man can recognize the Son of God or the Father in another man. So how do we recognize the Son of God? He's always pleasing the Father. He's doing things righteously. He's always in the spirit of righteousness, pleasing the, pleasing the Father. And the Father is speaking as a terror doctrine and deep spiritual principles. 
the, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 16. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we no more him. The apostle is saying that from now on, we should not relate to any man by his fallen nature, meaning who he is as a natural man, and that, and that includes his physical body. his physical body, and his education, his formal education, and financial status. We should always be looking for Christ, the image of God, who is the foundation of the Son of God that is being born in a man. So I have to change that. We should always be looking for the mind of Christ. was the foundation of the Son of God that is being born in a man. In addition, Paul is saying that if Christ is not found, that man is reprobate, meaning lacking the righteousness of God, and we should relate to him accordingly. What does that mean? Well, if you know that somebody's lacking the righteousness of God, you have to be careful you know, how you deal with them. Maybe if you're doing business with them, you want to get a signature on paper or uh, or however, or, or you don't expect you don't expect righteousness from somebody. You don't expect them to be dealing honestly with you, or whatever the situation is. You can. There are people that deal honestly that are not in Christ. All that this is saying here is that if someone doesn't have the, if doesn't have the spirit of Christ, you have to be. You have to try that man and be and just be aware that they may not be honest with you. You have to pray about everything that you deal with them. Titus 1.16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and, to, and unto every good work reprobate. So there are Christians that deny God, they're abominable, they're disobedient, and in every good work they're manifesting their carnal mind. So don't expect everyone that calls himself a Christian and carries a Bible to be righteous in their dealings with him, because the truth of the matter is, Today, most of them are not. Because the Lord has not started to deal with the church on that level yet. And it's, it's not, brethren, it's not even preached. It's not even preached today. How are you supposed to deal with your fellow man? I mean, even, even in the past, you know, I think there was preaching about hell and, uh, and there was preaching about drinking, that you shouldn't drink and you shouldn't smoke and, uh, they would preach against adultery and fornication, but I, to the best of my knowledge, there was no extensive teaching on business dealings, on keeping your word, on, on not lying, on if you say you're going to do something, you do it, and if for some reason you can't do it, you have to ask the person for, to, to, to release you. Uh, all of these things that God is trying to teach us now, which is all honorable, righteous relationships with people, I don't remember hearing anything about that was the major sins in the early days of the church. But if you want to go on with God, if you want longevity, brethren, mm -hmm. you have to deal, deal honorably with every human being, even someone on the street in tatters. <laughs> and that's the real test. How do you deal with people that are weaker than you are? That is the real test, brethren, because the fallen nature and the fallen mind of mortal man automatically sees it easy pickings if someone's weak. They see to take advantage of them. And that is the fallen nature. And if you haven't seen it in yourself yet, ask the Lord to show it to you. Because you will not resist it unless you know that it's there. And it's there in everybody. You respect people that have power in this world, and you don't respect people who don't. And the least power that they have the more likely your fallen nature is to think you can get away with something. Okay. So don't do it. If that's what your fallen nature tells you to do, don't do it. Help them. You need to help the weak ones. Help them stand up on their feet. Don't use them or take advantage of them. Of course, there's an advocate in heaven, especially if they know the Lord. You better watch out.
So that's um, that's pretty much uh, as far as we got on Thursday. I will be Jeremiah 6, 27 to 30 to you because 